Okay, welcome everybody to the Eternal Spoiler Breakdown. My name is Pojo, and we had a bunch more cards got released, so we're going to be doing pretty regular spoiler breakdowns, it seems like. Uh, this many cards in this short of a time says we're probably pretty close to release. Uh, I would expect it probably in the next two weeks. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be gone, but that's okay. Uh, we are going to be looking first at First Flame, which... Boy, is this an exciting card. 11 cost, 8-8. Eight, eight. Whenever one you or one of your units hits the enemy player, play a 3-1 Flame Fang with Reckless. Summon, you play a 5-5 five, five in Furnace. And Tribute, you play three 5-5 five, five in Furnaces instead. And uh, in Furnaces, of course, are 5-5 five, five Charge Elementals that die at the end of your turn. Uh, the Flame Fang is just a 3-1. I think it's Reckless. Yeah, it's Reckless. OBS crashed, maybe. Nope, there we go. So, yeah, just a 3-1 Reckless Elemental Serpent. That's pretty cool. But uh, overall, like, not, not that big a deal. All right. Let's get back to that first flame. Okay. So this card's exciting for a number of different reasons, and the main one is that it is just, like, an amazingly good top-end card and something that Red finally gets to do with all of that ramp that it's got. It's got a ton of interesting, sort of weird, splashy ramp cards. End of the Barrel, in particular, was one that was introduced where it was like, okay, this card is amazing if you can do something at 10 or 11. Because if you can play End of the Barrel and actually get, like, the amount of power that you want, then clearly there's going to be something fun off of it. And, you know, like, the answer to that is maybe you play End of the Barrel to play Caleb to play an 8-drop, but then if what about the Tribute? What do you do with 10 power? You can Flame Blast your opponent's face for 9. That's not bad. That's certainly an okay finisher. But you want something really ridiculous, and First Flame definitely provides that, since if you've got the Tribute, you're very likely swinging in for 15 on the turn that First Flame is played. So yeah, super amazing, ridiculous nonsense to play First Flame off of a Tribute. This card also works with reanimated related reanimate related shenanigans such as grasping at shadows like you can do some really crazy things with this card just because it is such an immediate and disgusting board impact off of a tribute it is really really hard for your opponent to deal with three five five infernaces especially when those infernaces create other permanent effects that you have to deal with and also you get a fairly decent mono colored beater that has to be killed as well like this thing just has all of the necessary influence on the board to do anything that you could want there's so much stuff that's good about it and you know like once you have flame fangs with reckless like caleb's are also super happy to have it like there's a lot of different ways that you're going to get to lethal with this card i'd say this is probably the most impactful drop above 10 that we've seen like even eight of the huru hasn't like blown out in the way that first flame does like this card just ends the game and it does it in pretty spectacular fashion it's crazy solid uh like it's really really good and overall like this is just an amazing thing to be doing at your top end so so uh, Combustion Cell plus um, End of the Barrel is one of the easy ways to get First Flame out. Another thing that this actually does is it enables Dramatist's Mask to be very good. And uh, yeah, like uh, basically like it is just an insane Dramatist's Mask card. So Dramatist's Mask, if you don't remember, is the four cost one one weapon that at the end of at the start of your next turn, you sacrifice the unit that has a Dramatist's Mask, and then you put into play a random unit from your deck. Now, not only does this card just justify the existence of Dramatist's Mask, which previously did not look like a very powerful card at all, it actually makes an entire combo control deck available, where essentially you play a unitless deck with Grenadine Generators, Caleb's Intervention maybe, uh, your standard assembly line, your granite, or your is it Granite Waystone? Granite Waystones. And then you just play a Dramatist Mask on your unit along with a bunch of counter spells up or something along those lines, and you first flame and you blow completely out. Like, that's a ton of ridiculous units all at once. It's a bunch of flame fangs. You still probably got counter spells available at that point, and then you basically just the next turn sacrifice your Dramatist Mask for the first flame and get another first flame with charge. And, like, alone, first flame is an 8-8 with a Dramatist Master for 9 plus 15 points on the Infernuses, so it's probably going to kill your opponent the first time that it comes out. So, like, playing this with, like, some Caleb's Choices, some, uh, 
backlashes and unseals, and then just like a reasonable amount of ways to make sure that you can actually get what you need out of it, along with cards like End of the Barrel and all of that other nonsense. Like that actually sounds like a legitimate fire primal control combo deck. Uh, so like there's a real actual potentially good tier two to tier one deck with Dramatist Mask. I would say tier one is probably pushing it that that's a pretty degenerate strategy i'm guessing that there are lots of ways to stop that uh but nonetheless like it is really really solid i would say that this card is just absolutely like amazing as far as like 11 drops go and if you're gonna play an 11 drop this is definitely the 11 drop to play like this card is just amazing so yeah uh, if you can afford it, it's well worth it, and while red does not often go for 11, this gives you all of the reason in the world to do so. So, absolutely just a sickeningly good card. I'm really glad that this card exists, because I love big red stuff, and I'm glad that big red stuff has something really interesting to do, to do all of the big red things that it really likes to do. Okay, we got some other stuff that actually works out along those lines. So, um... Let's talk about spells first. There's a Spells Matters theme, a minor Spells Matters theme in this set that we haven't really talked about yet, but does seem to exist. We've seen a couple of different cards that care about more spells in your void, and we have also seen some cards uh, that specifically are pl uh, paying attention to whether or not you have played spells this turn. They're kind of like tributes, except they count only for spells. So, like, you can consider this like a sort of secondary tribute mechanic. Really, like, this is a fast-paced set. It's really going to re revolve around doing lots of different things all at once. I think there's, like, a crazy amount of potential for really ridiculous powers and really ridiculous combos in the whole set. And we're going to talk about one of them now, Pyre Elemental, a 4-3 charge that costs 4 less if you have played a spell this turn at common. Hey, at last, some sort of weird enabler for trail stories. <laughs> So Pyre Elemental is probably on the weak side for most types of decks, but if you're playing spell-based aggro, yep, that seems like it's something you want to do. Like, you can certainly do something like use a Trail Stories to discount a assembly line or something along those lines, play your Pyre Elemental at 2 with Charge, or maybe play it with a Torch, something crazy like that. You could just go Torch and Pyre Elemental at 3, like, that's not actually all that bad for a charge 4-3. This card is not particularly well-statted, but charge is an ability that usually makes up for that. The fact that it is torchable means that it's, uh, you know, not going to be the most amazing ranked card in the world, but I can definitely see, like, a particularly good spell-based Pyre Elemental deck doing a lot of work. I'd say overall this card is pretty well-balanced. It is just good, consistent red aggro. Like, you definitely like to play it in draft with a lot of spells, but you don't like to play it in draft without a lot of spells. You're kind of okay with a 4-3 in draft without a lot of spells, but overall like that is a that is going to be a little bit weird so yeah this doesn't work with unstable form um yeah that sounds correct i'm pretty sure that you would unstable form it into a three drop because if you had played a spell that turn but cute to know all right so yeah pyre elemental seems like a neat aggressive one there's also some more defensive ones like coastal battle mage Coastal Battle Mage is a 3-3 Aegis that says when you play a spell, this gets plus one, plus one this turn. Uh, like, that's much more suited for a defensive setup, because you get essentially a unit that sticks on the ground, and then turns any type of combat trick into an additional plus one, plus one bonus. So you can get some decent lineups against other units and trade in really interesting ways. This card has very flexible and weird stats, which makes it somewhat hard to deal with and somewhat more difficult to play around. It's in double green, which makes it a little bit difficult to get the spells that you most want for Coastal Battle Mage, like Finest Hour and other things really work. I can see this card actually being in a Huru Envoy style deck with a lot of like spell-based draw stuff. That could be kind of fun. Wouldn't be like insanely good, but I think it might be up there. Overall, the card is not like extremely powerful, but I don't know. A 3-3 three, three Aegis for 3 is, 3-3 three, three Aegis for 3 is, eh, you know, overall pretty okay. And that plus one, plus one bonus does actually add up. So this has some potential to be stronger than it looks. Uh, the stat line is just straight stock standard. Like this is definitely a good card in draft because a 3-3 three, three Aegis for 3 is extremely solid, especially with that modular skill. Like this is a fun uncommon for a really interesting style of play. And yeah, that that this should be a lot of fun to play with in draft. 
Okay, the other spell-based option that we picked up is Wormstone. Man, I love this card. Okay, so when you play a spell, sacrifice Wormstone to play the A7-7 Sandworm Exhausted. You don't get to ambush it, which is a bit of a bummer because it gets that exhausted effect, and I don't believe that Endurance will prevent it from being exhausted even if you play the spell. But this is still kind of a neat little trick where you can play a 4-cost card and get a 1-1, one, one, or get a 7-7 seven, seven for free pretty quickly. Um, whether or not that's going to be aggressive enough is really an interesting question. Like, you can certainly do red-yellow spell-based shenanigans where you play trail stories after Wormstone, and then you have your two drops as well, and all sorts of that kind of weird stuff. Like, you can maybe do some interesting stuff with this. I'm curious to see how it turns out. I really wish it wasn't exhausted, but obviously that would be a very powerful card, because you'd have a pseudo-ambush thing that would very much stymie any sort of aggression and force your opponent not to attack, which, that's a boring play pattern. I understand why it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't do that. So, uh, yeah, like, overall, this card is eh, reasonably okay. Like, a 4-cost 7 7 is not anything amazing considering that it's conditional and the thing that's interesting about it is that it actually activates some relic based strategies it behaves well with cards that care about relics in certain ways and then you can also like sacrifice it later to get a bigger thing or do something cool so there are ways that this card could maybe play around certain things and you can of course use it with like reliquary reader and other stuff to basically create a thing on the board and then later on turn it into a very very big worm uh, it's a cool draft card if you can get it set up and uh, yeah i think the limited format the spell based focus in limited format like the limited format is looking just really really good okay uh two other cards got shown off or rather three because we got a token on one of these the first is teacher of Humil humility which is a monotime bomb and potentially pretty good in some other forms of decks uh, so Teacher of Humility is a two-cost, double-time, 3-3. Three, three. You know, like Argentport uh, Instigator stats, that's already extremely strong. And it has Infiltrate, play disciplinary weights on the enemy player, and then each player draws a card. Now, there's a lot of good things going on with this card. First off, the stat line is just straight good for aggro. Like, you're pretty into it. It's just lots and lots of fun. Secondly, the Disciplinary Weights card is a Cursed Relic that whenever the Cursed player draws an additional card, increases its cost by 3. Now, this just straight up interferes with any control plans that actually want to kill your stuff, especially decks that want to like Hailstorm and deal with the 3-3s three that you're playing. So Disciplinary Weights makes for a lot of problems if you ever hit your opponent with it. Like, this is not just the one bit of card advantage that you get from your infiltrate where you get a card and your opponent gets a significantly less useful card that he might not even be able to play it's also the fact that every time that they try to do anything their cards that they draw that are extra are going to cost even more and you can set up some weird shenanigans with that if you can actually get the infiltrates across over and over again so it's a must kill two drop that means that it's a very very strong time drop and overall it should fit unit based aggro strategies very 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 well. There's some Combray decks that are going to love it, Mono Time's going to love it, and I think there might be some Elysian decks as well that are really going to be very happy with it. Uh, whether or not it sees play in Xenon, I kind of doubt it. Doesn't really seem like Xenon's kind of bag, but you know, there might be some potential for it there. Um, depends on if you have any kind of interesting aggro. Praxis aggro we haven't seen much of yet, but cards like Wormstone and Pyre Elemental imply that there are going to be some pretty aggressive spell-based options that may actually work out with Teacher of Humility. We'll see, we'll see. All right, we got one more card, and that's a choice. Uh, we already saw Rindra's choice, so that means that we have a whole cycle of choices coming out of various other heroes that are not Scions in the setup. And this one is Seraph's choice, which is appropriately costed at 8. Okay, so Seraph's choice is double the strength and health of your units this turn, or draw a unit of your choice from your deck and double its strength and health. Now, the top modular option is typically the better one because it is just your big blowout that allows you to kill your opponent in a really really spectacular fashion if you're up at eight and you're using CRF's choice you're probably going to get a huge amount of value out of it and do some pretty cool things that being said uh, if you don't if you are behind this card still does cool things by getting you a specific tutor with an extremely high power bonus so you can pick up cool accelerate options you can pick up cool like 
all sorts of like interesting cards that can do kind of ridiculous stuff and like basically if you get charge units or things with double damage or interesting lifesteal options or any sort of immediate board impact or cards that just need survivability like there are lots of ways that Siraf's choice is like your top deck of choice against control setups which is exactly where this card kind of belongs seeing as it is an eight cost spell that's also pretty fun with you know any sort of fun ramp if you want to do like your standard big shenanigans and combo Combray. Big Combray is always a deck that loves to have very big units, so this is something that you could potentially get and get a lot of advantage out of. I think, uh, <laughs> I mean, clearly the thing to get right is uh, you got to get your six green influence and your six time influence, and then you got your 32 32 champion of <laughs> progress. That's progress. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this card's fun. I'm not sure if it's good, but it is uh, pretty interesting and could be a decent top end for Combray decks. Overall, there's not a lot of things that it belongs in, but it's an interesting card both in draft and ranked. Um, and like, I think it does have like a little bit of a spot in those types of decks. So could be cool. Seems like one of the weaker choices that we're going to get out of all of the batch, but Combray has so many strong cards that it's okay to have some kind of interesting modular tool, even if the modular tool is at eight, like, uh, Combray just doesn't get that many options for that. It's a fairly linear setup. So getting some kind of choice like this actually does help them out. And, you know, this is a card that fetches a 10-10 Akaria in Akaria time. So, like, that seems pretty okay. Like, could be lots and lots of fun. Um, yeah, like, overall, you've got some pretty good options and uh, could be really, really neat. That's actually all of our cards, and that's it for the spoiler breakdown for tonight. We're going to keep this one short and sweet. But uh, nonetheless, thank you guys so much for watching. We'll be back with some brews very soon, and I will see you guys next time.